Hello, mamas. Welcome to episode one in our own Your Birth series. Today, we're talking all about how to make the transfer to hospital as smooth and positive as possible. Enjoy. Hey, mama, I'm sending you wonderful pregnancy vibes. It's time for you to guide you through. Let's take some time for you. It's pregnancy with physio Laura. Hello, mamas, and welcome back to the Pregnancy with Physio Laura podcast. We are kicking off another amazing series. There's been a lot of birth focus recently, but I, to be honest, just can't quite get enough of birth. So this one is the Own Your Birth series with the amazing doula and women's health physio, Eleanor Lambert. Now this series I've called Own Your Birth because I think we're taking a really powerful message about how to control what you can control in birth. And that's what these four episodes coming up are going to be centered around how you can own your own birth experience. So I think it's very empowering and Eleanor is definitely the right lady to be teaching us what we're going to be learning. So Eleanor is a full spectrum doula and a women's health physio, which is super cool. It's like my hashtag dream job to combine the two together. So she lives in Newcastle with her husband, James, and her daughter, Genevieve. Now, following her own experience with pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, Eleanor felt driven to help other women and support them to have a similarly positive journey. As both a women's health physio and doula, Eleanor has a unique opportunity to support women throughout their entire pregnancy journey, advocating for informed choice and supportive care. And if you do want to follow Eleanor up, you can find her on Instagram at eleanor.lambert.doula. Now in this four part podcast series, we're going to be covering today's episode all about how to transfer to the hospital in as smooth and as positive a way as possible, which is awesome. Episode two, we're going to cover birth positions and all the weird and wonderful ways women can give birth and the pros and cons of them all. Episode three, we're going to specifically be talking about inductions and cesarean sections and how we can really own our birth, even when intervention and even when surgeries and medical interventions are required and all the factors that we can control, which is epic because a lot of people think you throw the baby out with the bathwater when there are interventions like that. And then episode four is about processing birth trauma. So that's really important because we know that that's super prevalent at the moment. So this is a four part series. If you want to watch all these episodes at once, as always, they are inside my online pregnancy program, The Pregnancy Posse, along with all your weekly workouts, all your epic birth content and birth preparation. And I always forget to mention, but people are like, oh my God, I can't believe this is included. My one hour live active birth class is inside there. That is in and of itself the most valuable thing, I think, personally. That is an entire birth class waiting for you to watch. That is free inside the Pregnancy Posse too. So if you're looking to prepare for birth, if you're listening to this series wanting to own your birth, come and jump inside the Pregnancy Posse. If you want to feel nurtured and prepared and confident and you can access all of these episodes at once, plus the wonderful Eleanor has given all Pregnancy Posse members some bonus content, which is so awesome. So she has filmed this epic video showing you all of the different birthing positions and explaining the detailed reasons for the why they're helpful um, and what scenarios you could use them in. Because I think it's one thing to hear people talk about birthing positions. It's another thing to actually see it. So that's really cool. And she's also given us a really epic checklist. If you are having an induction or a C-section about all the little factors and questions and things that you might want to consider to own your birth, to have a really powerful, positive experience with that. So if you want to check that out, Pregnancy Posse members, you have free access to that. You can find out more at thepregnancyposse.com. But without further ado, let's jump into today's episode all about how to transfer to the hospital well. We're going to talk about the importance of doing things like a dry run. We're going to talk about the importance of communicating what you want before you get to the big day so that everyone is on board with knowing what is important to you. We're going to talk about when to transfer because I know that's hot in a lot of people's minds. You know, you don't want to go too soon, but you don't want to leave it too late. We're going to talk about the importance of planning, packing your bags correctly, doing a dry run, like I said reframing what stalling in labor means and how we can resettle once you get to hospital so that we can pump that oxytocin again because that's super super important so you're gonna love today's episode we know that 
99% of women are giving birth in hospital. So this is relevant to pretty much every pregnant woman under the sun right now. Really important listen. I hope you enjoy it. And if you do, jump on over to at Physio Laura and let me know what your biggest takeaways were. I always love knowing what you got out of the podcast episode. So let's jump right in with Eleanor and chat all about it. Hello, Eleanor, and welcome to the podcast. I'm so pumped to have you here. As we were talking about before the show, you're a magical unicorn. You're a doula and a women's physio, which is such a rare breed today. And I know you're going to impart so much wisdom. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's a, a real, real joy to be able to sit with someone that kind of understands what level I'm on and just natural on about all things that we're passionate about. So thank you for having me here. Yeah, you're like my career inspo at the moment. I'll probably be the doula next year. <laughs> all right, I'll mentor you. Yeah. It'll be good. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll nut it out together. <laughs> I love it. Now, the first theme that we wanted to kick off with today is talking about transferring to the hospital. Now, I know a lot of women we know in Australia right now are giving birth in the hospital. Majority of women are giving birth in the hospital. But so many women want to be able to capitalise on labouring at home, on their own, being as calm and collected as possible. But I know that there is a lot of fear and anxiety around how to transfer that vibe and that feeling over into the car and into the hospital. So I wanted to talk to you about what your ethos is and what your advice is to your clients on how to transfer to the hospital well and the importance of them feeling safe and comfortable in their environments and ways that they can maybe manage if labour does stall or how they can try and minimise that stall. So take the mic, Eleanor, and tell us all about it. <laughs> I think one of the biggest things when you're transferring is, is acknowledge that it might happen. So even if you're having a planned home birth or you're having a free birth or you're birthing at home with, um, you know, midwifery support, it's acknowledge that you may need to transfer to hospital. Don't have it as this, oh, no, that won't happen, that won't happen, I can just ignore it. Actually go, cool, in the event of. So when I'm dealing with or when I'm supporting a client, especially if they're having a home birth, we create a birth map for hospital transfer. We have the conversation and we go, you know, have you packed a go bag? Have you considered whether you drive or call an ambulance, um, it's about unpacking it and actually acknowledging that it might be a reality. And then once you've kind of, it's not the elephant in the room anymore. It's not that, oh, shit, like we won't, we just won't prepare for it because it's not going to happen. You actually create it as a, an object that you talk through. So um, I think the big thing is, as I kind of, as you said, I, I did a post today about this. And um, so it's all very nicely timed is, talk to your partner about it and kind of go, okay, in what situations would you transfer to the hospital? When in your labour do you want to transfer to the hospital? And what are the, the logistics that you're having to deal with? So are you five minutes from the hospital? Are you, I've got a client at the moment who's 90 minutes from the hospital that she's booked in with and mm -hmm. talk to your partner and find out what their concerns are. What are your concerns? Do they want to be more planned? Do they want less planning? And then get to a point where you both kind of understand, okay, in the event that we transfer, what do we need to do? Mm. Where's the stuff? Do we have our go bag? What's our plan? How are we going to approach it? Mm. Do a dry run if you can. So especially if you're not really familiar with the hospital that you're going to drive there uh, without the pressure of an actual transfer. So don't do it when you're in labour for the first time. <laughs> do a dry run find out where the parking is, find out, you know, can you just park your car at the front and drop and go in? What's the kind of routine? Do you have to press some buzzer and talk to somebody? What are the actual steps that you have to make when you get there? The other thing is to talk about when. So if you're birthing in a hospital and you're labouring at home, at what stage do you want to go to the hospital? Is it about... Um, the time that it's going to take you to get there? Is it about you want to make sure that you're labouring at home for a certain amount of time so that you're physiologically in a particular aspect or a part of, of labour where you're less likely to be frazzled? Is it actually about getting there earlier so that you can set up the space, you can set up the room, you can get comfortable? Mm -hmm. Because especially if you're labouring at home, you don't necessarily want to be the one that's 100% calling the shots. Like you might want your partner to understand so they can say, oh, hey, I think we should go to the hospital now. Um, 
especially I know you've talked a lot about the physiology of labor recently and we don't really want you in that logical analytical part of your brain so if you're having to sit there going one okay I've had this many contractions in this long I probably should go now Mm. you're staying in that frontal lobe you're staying in that analytical brain and we don't really want you to be hanging around there we want you to make sure you're safe and go cool I can start laboring now for that to happen your support team or your partner or your midwife or whoever's in that realm with you kind of needs to have an idea of when you want to transfer to the hospital Mm. one of the big things that we think about when we're thinking around transfer is the fact that you're changing locations now we know adrenaline and oxytocin balance is really important in labor we need adrenaline in that first part of labor because we need to be able to make sure we're safe I talk about lions with all of my clients that back in the day you mean adrenaline or oxytocin you said what did I say we need adrenaline we do. We oh, do need adrenaline. We do. We do. I was like, did I stutter? <laughs> so we do need adrenaline in that early part of labor because if we think about lions, back in the day, we're laboring under a tree. We're in this really good throw of labor. Or even before that, we feel the first twinges of labor. We need to make sure that we're birthing in a safe place. So we gather our people around us and we go, where am I? Cool. Is this safe? Yes, this is safe. Okay, I can relax. So I'll get to the lines later. In that first stage, we need to be cognizant. We need to be aware of our surroundings. In a modern context, do you have your bag? Have you got someone to come and look after the dog? Do you have an older sibling that needs to get chuffed off to Nana and Grandpa's house? Is your partner at work? Do you have your phone charger? Where are your snacks? All those really, really important things. Mm. You do need that adrenaline to have that awareness to go, okay, cool. Well, have I ticked all those boxes? Am I in a safe place? Have I got everything I needed to do? Have I rung my midwife? Have I rung my doula? Yes, cool. Brilliant. Then you want the balance of of adrenaline to shift back down to get that beautiful, uh, complementary interaction with oxytocin oxytocin then starts to build we go into our labor and so on and so forth if we stay in that adrenaline mind we don't then progress into the oxytocin and the other kind of hormones of labor so when we're transferring from home to a hospital instead of finding that safe place at home and staying at home we're relocating When we have a relocation during labour, it's kind of equivocal to a lion coming around the corner and disturbing our labour. And our body goes, oh, lion, that's that's not a good, that's not a good thing at all. And because our body perceives a threat, we have that increase in adrenaline again, things slow down because our body wants to make sure that we're safe. Mm -hmm. So if we're going from our home environment to the hospital even if it's planned even if we're like oh cool I've been laboring at home for x now I'm going to hospital especially if it's unplanned our body's doing the right thing by potentially slowing down our labor because we are changing locations we are changing stimuli we are changing input and it's going hang on a minute I just need to double check that where we're going is as safe as where we were hmm. so when you're transferring from home to the hospital one of the best things that you can do is try and stay in labor land. You want to stay in the zone. You don't want to be getting in the car and getting your phone out and telling your partner how to get there or backseat driving or telling them to slow down because then you're coming into your frontal lobe. I know we all want to do it. Then you come back into your frontal lobe and when you're in your frontal lobe, you're really logical. And again, you're coming further and further away from that animalistic primal labor brain. So You decided to transfer for whatever reason, put an eye mask on, cover your eyes, darken, shut the world out, chuck some earbuds in, put some, you know, hypnobirthing tracks if you're doing it, or just, you know, Spice Girls remixes or meditation music, whatever you need, but put some earbuds in, shut down your senses, get in the back seat, don't get in the front seat. You don't have to sit, be safe, but you might you know, be twisted or you might be on your all fours, however you can safely travel, but be comfortable, shut the world out 
and don't try and control the transfer. Mm. That's going to carry the be- the beneficial balance of hormones the best from home to hospital. Mm. Then when you get there, again, we're thinking about the fact that you've just changed locations. So you're going to get to the hospital. And if you, again, have too much of that stimuli, you're going to flip that balance again and your brain's going to pump more adrenaline out, take you out of that labor land so you can establish whether or not you're in safe surroundings. So again, in that preparation, is your partner comfortable talking to the staff? Does your partner know what to say? Does your support team want to know more information so they can go up to the media, the midwife and say, oh, she's been in labor since this long with this kind of contraction you know, she's had a mucus plug or her waters have gone or those kind of important pieces of information so that when you get to the hospital, again, you don't need to come out of that labour brain. You don't need to come into that analytical brain. Mm. So making sure that your partner is confident with all that information so you can literally walk in, eyes on, ears closed, holding onto a railing, blowing like a cow and your partner sorts out all the logistics, gets mm. you to the birth space. Mm. That's that, that real important part of transferring. Mm. And I think it's it's about seeing a transfer as a potential rather than a threat. Because if you're holding on to this, I'm going to labour at home until my baby's nearly crowning, I really don't want to go to the hospital. Well, then as soon as you start thinking, oh, shit, I'm going to have to transfer, especially if you're transferring later in your labor well then that's going to bring up a whole bunch of emotion that's not conducive Mm. to a positive experience if you take the steps you plan for it you get your go bag you talk through it with your partner you do a dry run then if you go oh I have to go to hospital yeah you're still going to have those feelings but at least the logistics are taken care of and it doesn't become this big scary oh I don't actually have my staff or How am I going to manage the drive or, Hmm. you know, it's going to be so uncomfortable. Hmm. You've addressed it. I think that reframe is really good. Rather than looking at it like this friction point, looking at it like, yes, potential, but also like if you prepare for it, then it's going to make that so much easier. So I like that you've addressed both aspects. So you've got your people planning a home birth who really do need to factor in a plan B so that they're not thrown out when there is a potential hospital transfer on the cards. And um, I had prepared for that myself with my home birth. So I had packed a hospital bag just with, you know, some onesies and like pads and just some things for me. And it didn't throw me in that like, oh, well now I'm manifesting that you know I'm gonna go to hospital it was more that I can fully surrender now because I know whatever happens I'm prepared and I don't then have to be in the back of my mind oh but if that were to happen like we're gonna have to scrounge things together and I'm not at all prepared and whatnot and then I like that like we mentioned before I can't remember the exact home birth rates but they're so low so we know that like 90 something percent of women in Australia are having hospital births so Those women, though, are going to start labouring at home, a lot of them. So I like that you've then addressed for those women. These are the things to think about because you are going to hospital. Like, a few people have babies in transit, sure, and there's some unplanned home births, sure. But majority of you are going to end up in hospital. And it's about, like, knowing, like you said, the dry run. Because I know many a woman who has never taken their partner to the hospital, they're being the only ones there, and they don't know that if this main intersection is blocked because of roadworks, how do yeah. I get around that? Where's the plan B to still get there as fast as possible? And that's where's sort of the part. parking? Exactly. Where do I drop you off? Like these sorts of things are just so vital. And I think the other anxiety that comes up for a lot of women is, like you were saying, when do I leave? And I think if you yeah. can like have it in the back of your mind, speak to your support team about. When X happens, this is when we will decide to move, assuming that, you know, you're still in a good frame of mind and you want to do that. Um, Because then you can just completely relax. You don't have to be going the whole time. When am I going to go? When am I going to go? Because it's a catch, right? I can see where women, particularly first-time labourers, are caught because you don't want to go too early because you don't want to be on the clock. We know that in hospital you're going to be put on the clock. They're not going to let you labour for four days and just use up a room. (laughs) Unfortunately, early labor so we don't want to be put on a clock so we don't want to go too early we also don't want to be sent home because I know a lot of women 
don't want to get there and they kind of feel disappointed that they're going to re return home. So you want to time it so that, you know, like you're in established labor, but then you don't want to be in such intense labor that the car ride is awful yeah. or that you're about to push a baby out mid car trip. So I totally yeah. get that squeeze for women where they're like, when is the perfect time to transfer? So what's the general ethos? Like last time I did hospital birth classes, they told us three contractions in 10 minutes. Is that still the current sort of general advice or do you have a different ethos on when is the right time to transfer or is it dependent on the individual and their anxieties and their comfort levels? All of the above, <laughs> all of the above. So yeah, the general ethos, ethos tends to still be like the three or four contractions in 10 minutes, but I tend to talk to my clients about patterns. So if you've had your contractions have gone from one in every hour to one in every half an hour and then 15 minutes, then 10 minutes, and then, the, you know, three or four in every 10 minutes. Okay, cool. But if they're very kind of unpredictable, maybe you wait to see a pattern. But some women never have patterns to their labour. Some women have a regular labour. That's where calling the birth centre is a really important thing to do. And I think a lot of people, when they're, planning to labor at home and then transfer they kind of forget that they can talk to somebody mm. and they're like oh my god but when do we decide to go to the hospital it's like when the advice around you makes sense yeah. because you're going to call the birth suite you're going to talk to a midwife and I know that some people get told not to come when they should and I know people get told they're sent home when they shouldn't and and you know everyone's going to have a different experience but generally you're going to ring someone and they're going to talk to you and they're going to go oh cool well head up soon or no, stay at home for a bit. But I tend to go, look at the pattern, look at how you're feeling. If you can't talk to me during a contraction, you should already be in the car mm. and factoring in anxiety, distance and logistics. So I recently supported a birth. I mean, is it recent? March? Yeah, that's recent. Um, and they lived an hour away from the hospital that they were birthing in. And I spoke to her and she's like, yeah, yeah you know, via text. She's like, yeah, I'm having a couple of contractions. I was like, okay, okay. And then I hopped in the car. We decided that I was going to come to her. And for me to get to her was about an hour and 15. For her to get to the hospital about an hour. And I was like, well, I'll just come to you. And then I rang her. Whilst I was on the phone with her, she had three contractions when she was lying on the floor and couldn't talk to me. Mm. So I was like, hey, because you have an hour, do you think it might be worthwhile getting to the hospital sooner rather than later we can settle in we can mm. re-oxytocin if we need to but are you concerned about the hour because mm. that's the big thing if you're sitting at home and you're thinking I've got to stay here for as long as possible I've got to stay here for as long as possible I've got to drive for an hour I've no but I've got to stay here for as long as possible you're not actually honoring your feelings either way mm. if you've got a big drive if you don't feel comfortable staying at home, if having to transfer gives you anxiety, that's more important than anything. Sure. I've got another couple at the moment and they live 90 minutes from the hospital and her partner's really quiet uh, about the travel distance. So do you have a friend that lives close to the hospital? Mm. Are you in a position to, you know, get a short stay motel? can you lo relocate yourself from home close to the hospital mm. so that you do the bulk of the driving when you get twinges, mm. then you get to the next location, then you settle in, mm. then you're allowed, to, you allow yourself to labor it a bit more with a five minute drive or a 10 minute drive. So a lot of it is, yes, it's how long you're laboring for. Yes. It's your contraction frequency, but it's also how you feel. Because if you're the kind of person that feels safe in an environment like a hospital, and if you're the kind of person that goes, oh, yeah, like hospitals don't bother me, mm. you might want to go earlier. That's such a good point you make because you talk a lot about safety and how important that is for you to get into your birthing brain. But it, it is important, like you just said, to actually acknowledge there's some women who are going to feel safer in hospital yep. than they are at home, which I guess is the opposite for me. So yeah. I, so I haven't thought about that, but it just occurred to me then you're better off then going to the hospital absolutely because you're yeah. be able to dip into that real labor brain unless you feel yeah. safe. And if and I'm just thinking of a friend of mine who, yeah, she she panicked at the thought of not being at hospital. So yeah, I think that's a really important note to make that 
And there's other women who are going to feel much safer at home. And so they're the ones that are going to want to stay at home for as long as possible because they know that hospital doesn't feel as good to them. Um, So, yeah, that's really important to note. Where where is your safety? What environment feels most safe to you? Uh, I think that's really important for the person listening to this to reflect on that. And that's going to influence your plans for labour. Um, I'm wondering, Eleanor, do you recommend your clients have a conversation with their birth team at the hospital so that that transfer goes more smoothly, i.e. if you want dim lighting, if you want certain music, all these sorts of things, do you recommend that they speak to that their team about that so that it's a real swift, you know, turn up at the hospital, yep, this is Eleanor, we know that Eleanor wants a dark room and all these things. Yeah. And it can, action ha- um, it can be actioned faster than having to then yeah. say, this is where we're at and this is what we want. It unfortunately that doesn't happen across the board because of the different modes of care. So yes, if you're in a midwifery group practice and you've got the continuity of care and you know the same team, I think that's probably more likely to happen. If you're going through GP shared care or just obstetric care, you definitely go for it, talk to them about it. But the chances of you having the same midwife on the day that you rock up might not be the case Mm -hmm. I definitely say that if you're ringing birth suite at the first twinge say I want the room with the bath in it if you've got preferences like that I want the room with the bath in it I want the room with a window um I'm gonna come with a you know an eye mask on and and earbuds don't talk to me so yes definitely Mm -hmm. I think probably the more important person to talk to is your partner or your birth support yeah yeah so and and that for you yeah say to your birth partner okay cool well regardless of what state i'm in when we get to the hospital i want lights off clocks off the wall my pillow and my do not on the bed push the bed to the side of the room get a floor mat in the middle chuck again spice girls remixes on there's my music put my aromatherapy on put up my fairy lights whack my affirmations everywhere put up the picture of our dog and our chickens, give them the information. Because number one, if you go to the hospital early enough that you're able to, you might be happy to do that. Mm. But number two, you might turn up in a position where you don't want to get out of your brain. You don't want to be thinking about those things. Number three, you might need to resettle when you get to the hospital, regardless of what stage you get there and that's part of that creating the safe environment it's that nesting it's making the room your own so I think giving your partner the information or your doula or your birth support whoever's your kind of main person giving them that information you don't have to rely on getting the same midwife or having a midwife who's having a good day who has the time to do that you're taking it out of the hands of anybody else and you're just going okay well this is the plan when we get there these are the 10 things that I really need you to do in the room. Yeah, taking ownership over your birth preferences. Yeah. Because I don't think it can be assumed that that should be someone else's responsibility because we all want different things from birth. We all vibe off different things as well. So it's really important that you take ownership over that by communicating beforehand with your partners or your birth team that this is what's really important to you. Find (laughs) the proxy and then educate the proxy. So whoever that is, this is what I need the room to be. Can you please make sure that you do that regardless of what stage we get? Mm. Don't walk in and sit on your phone. Don't walk in and look around. Get unpacking. Get setting up. And I think this message is just really important as well because I'm sure there's a lot of women out there who don't understand why labour stalls when you change environments and that might put a negative spin on that or what's wrong with me? Why is this... Happening or feel like it's a, a bad thing where it's a totally normal, acceptable, it's a positive thing. I really like that yep. reframe that you said this is a good thing. This is your body working well because your body is having to recalibrate and go yep. and scan the environment. Am I safe? And then once it realizes you are safe, then you can get back into it. And so I think it's yep. really important for women to know to expect this. Yes. And to know that that's a good thing. It means your body's working well. Yes. And yep. that's you just need to remind your body it's safe and slip back into your oxytocin bubble yeah. and carry on rather than demonizing the stalling of labor. I think that's. Yeah. And I talk all the time with anyone that will listen to me <laughs> about <laughs> the fact that expect a stall. Yeah. You're going to get to hospital. 
expect it. Expect that your labor is going to change. And, and if it was every three minutes, it might lengthen. Just expect there to be a change because your body is reassessing your environment and your body's looking for the lion. Your body's looking for that danger and your brain's going, okay, like, uh, can we go back into that labor land? Can we kind of resettle into that zoned out? So you get there and you go, okay. And instead of going, oh, now, oh, it's going to take four more days, go, mm-hmm. okay, cool. This is normal. Yeah. This happens physiologically for a number of important reasons. Talk to the, if, if, if you are getting pressure from medical staff, say, I just want three or four hours to be left on my own. Am I safe? Is my baby safe? Is there any reason I can't just do this? Ask for the time, create the oxytocin bubble, create the safe space, and then work on getting yourself back into that positive mindset. So dance, hug, lay on the bed and spoon, um, listen to really important music, look at your birth affirmations, do whatever you need to do to resettle yourself and tip that balance back into oxytocin. For sure. And I think there's so many natural and normal stalls in labour, but I think a big problem, I guess, is that we also think labour's linear. So, you know, it just carries on this perfect little trajectory and it should only continue to increase and increase and increase. But that's not true. And labour can look so different for so many women and there's no right way as well. So I think a lot of women yeah, put a a negative spin on it because they think that they're regressing or they're going backwards and that's not at all true. So I think that's really important for women to note around the stalling as well. So that's all. And it's the language. It's the language. But someone says, oh, your labor's stalled and we go, ah, Yeah. Whereas if someone said, oh, your labor's plateaued or your labor has stalled, but that's okay. I think there's so much language because, yeah, bad news travels faster than good news and we've all got a friend that has told us a story about their birth and how they stalled and then all broke loose and they had a very very traumatic birth experience that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to happen for you yeah and it is about kind of flipping that narrative and going I got to hospital my labor slowed down cool I'm gonna go do a wee yeah I'm gonna you know have some fruit I'm gonna put my sparkle lights up I'm gonna give my partner a hug I'm gonna take the reprieve and go okay all right I know why this is happening what can I do about it xyz and then you do the things yeah and we all probably have a negative spin on stalled from like when we're all trying to drive manual back in the day because it was never a good thing just <laughs> we're all probably a little I still drive. drive a manual and I love it <laughs> I love it. And it's the same with the language, I think, around failure to progress. It's like slow down. It feels good for me anyway. But um, that's a much nicer way to think about it rather than a failure to get somewhere or a stalling to get somewhere because it's just a slow down. Um, Incompetent cervix, failure to progress. We could do a whole episode on don't say this, say this instead. (laughs) Don't say this or I'll, yeah, throw you out of the room. Yeah, I'm trying to get my head around not saying delivery in a yes. sort of birth. I and I'm yeah. still catch myself saying delivery so often. It's so deeply ingrained in me. But I'm like, no, it's birth. It's not delivery. It is birth. So I'm trying. That's the yeah. one I'm working on at the moment. But pizzas are delivered. Babies are born. Yes. <laughs> Hello, mamas. I really hope that you loved that episode. And if you were one of those mamas who was sitting at home silently fretting about the thought of transferring to hospital, that you now feel really confident, really empowered about all of the different ways in which you can prepare for that. So this is for, like I said in the introduction, 99, I think, 99 point something percent of women are giving birth in a hospital. Like that's how common that is especially in Australia right now and so we know that we need to we we need to have experienced and practiced and prepared for this transfer because it's going to happen you know there's a few that will give birth in transit there's obviously a small minority that will have home births but majority of women are going to the hospital so whether you are nervous about that transition or not I think it's important to know how to prepare for it properly so I really hope that after listening to that you're like yep I've got this I've got my dry run planned I've got my bags packed I'm fully prepared I know when to transfer I know what to look out for I've factored in all of the different things and I also know that when I get to hospital 
I can expect a stall and that a stall in labor is not a bad thing. So as we say in that episode, like we should reframe what we think about stalling and slowing down of labor. It is actually a really good thing because your body is going, okay, I'm reassessing the environment. I need to know I'm safe before I can kick start again. So if you know that, then I think that's really powerful because you can then help to resettle yourself, pump the oxytocin and get back into your labor brain. So I really hope that helped. If you got something out of this episode, please come and tell me over at Physio Laura, comment on the podcast post and let me know what your biggest takeaway was from this episode and maybe what you've got in mind in terms of preparing yourself for that hospital transfer. I think it's really important to share tips and tricks with everyone. So please come and chat with me. And if you love the wonderful Eleanor and you want to learn more from her, you can find her on Instagram at eleanor.lambert.doula. She is a wealth of knowledge. She's always sharing amazing stuff. And for those who do want to absorb all of these episodes, there are four in this series. They will be released weekly, but if you want to get them all at once, we'll be talking birthing positions, inductions and C-sections and how you can make the most powerful, positive experience out of those and also birth trauma. All of these episodes are already uploaded inside my online program, The Pregnancy Posse, along with the bonus content from Eleanor, which is a video detailing all and showing and visualizing all of the different ways that you can give birth, which is super powerful for those who have never witnessed birth before. And also along with an epic checklist going through all of the different ways that you can control and you know, take ownership of having an induction or a C-section so that you can still make it your own. Because that's what this series is all about, owning your birth. Super, super important. So thank you so much for being here. Do make sure you subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. So just go to your favorite podcast player, hit subscribe to the Pregnancy with Physio Laura podcast, and I will catch you all very shortly for episode two, where we'll be going through all of the weird and wonderful and benefits and cons and all of the things about birthing positions. So stay tuned. I will see you all then.